Why does it have to be so complicated? Why? You think about uh, in the business world, you think about the, the different franchises that we have in the world, and, you know, a franchise is a business that has, you know, they've made this model of a business, and then they kind of cookie-cutter copy that model different locations. You know, we've got things like McDonald's and Hardee's and Zaxby's and all these. Those are franchises. Ace Hardware, it's a, it's a franchise. They've got a certain way that they go about doing something. And as long as they stick with that model that has been successful, then that business, generally speaking, is successful. What happens is many times businesses get bigger and they think they need to do different things and they'll veer from that original model. And that's, that's usually when things tend to break down. Sometimes it's for different reasons, but generally speaking, that's what you see. The, the church, when we think about the church, and I'm not saying it's a franchise, but there are some similarities there. The church has seen its growth. When you look through history and, and you see the times in which the church really thrived and grew, it was because the church was sticking with that model that Christ had gave. And, and what's interesting, same way with franchises, whenever that model is very simple and straightforward and to the point, it is easy to follow. And it is easy just to do what you're supposed to do. Well, is that not the way that the church is? God has made it simple enough that it ought not to be confusing. And yet man has made it confusing. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul is having to deal with some of those who would come in and try to change things. They, they want to do things their own way. They want to you know, mix up things a little bit. And he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 in verses 3 and 4, he says, I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom you have not preached, whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. When we think about the success of the church and the idea, look, it, it is a simple model. God has given us the pattern to go by. He has shown us how it is supposed to operate. It is, he has shown, look, this is what you're supposed to be doing. One of the main goals of the church in the world today is to spread the simple gospel. It says there in verse 3, he talks about how minds were corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. You see so much confusion in the world religiously. There are so many denominations out there. Why? Are there so many denominations? Well, it is because of the minds that have been corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. When we think about being in Christ, we know that if we, if we study the gospel in order to get into Christ, we, we get into Christ by obeying the gospel. And the gospel, too, is a simple gospel. And that's what we want to look at tonight. We want to look at the simplicity of the gospel, the simplicity of Christ. And no, I won't be able to talk to all, about all the simple things that are in Christ because it's complicated. Okay, not really. But you, you, there is a lot to it. And yes, you can, you can study and you can get deep into the gospel and you can learn things that maybe you never knew. There, there is a deepness to the gospel. But as far as being obedient to God's word, as far as us, as us doing what God requires of us to do, it is simple. And we need to keep it simple. First of all, let's look at the gospel and how simple the gospel is. Turn with me to Acts chapter 2. Acts 
Acts chapter 2, we have the foundation of the Lord's church. We have the first gospel sermon that is preached to any man there in Acts chapter 2. Now you'll remember at the beginning of that chapter that you see there, the, uh, you know, they're gathered in that upper room. And while they're gathered in that upper room, you know, the spirit comes down and you get the tongues of fire and, and you know, all of those things that are going on. Well, what happens is the people see that. And they hear them talking in different languages. And that confuses them. Some of them think they're drunk and, and different things like that. Well, in verse 14, Peter stands up and he raises his voice and says, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words, for these are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Now, I'm not going to read all that. But those prophecies were well known to those people. And whenever Peter repeated this prophecy, it would have perked their ears up because they were waiting on that day. They were waiting on that. At the end of that prophecy in verse 21, he says, And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But the problem with the Jews was they didn't know who the Lord was. And so the rest of this sermon is about showing the people there in Jerusalem, this is who the Lord is. And he says in verse 22, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands and have crucified and put him to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. And then in verse 25, he starts talking about another prophecy, a psalm that David had written. And in that psalm, I want you to notice verse 27 specifically. He told them, this psalm says, For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life, and you will make me full of joy in your presence. And Peter goes on to explain, that's not David. It's not talking about David, because David, David is both dead and buried in the grave. No, he is talking about the Christ. It says in verse 30, at the end of that verse, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul would not be left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. Now, in order to have that thought going on, there has to be a death, right? Well, he talked about that. He said, y'all put him to death. Here this prophecy is talking about the resurrection. You see, they hadn't thought about resurrection. They hadn't thought about how that was going to work because they believed that the Christ was going to come down and save them from the Romans. They hadn't, they hadn't put resurrection in that thought process. So Peter shows them, look, this is why the Christ came. So that he could be raised from the dead and he would loose those pains of death. And then he goes on to explain who Jesus is in verse 32. This Jesus God raised up of which we are all witnesses, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. And he's referring to the pouring out of the Holy Spirit that they witnessed. And so they witnessed these things. They understand that Peter is talking the truth. He is telling these things from God. And he says in verse 36, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, he gets interrupted right there. But I want you to notice what Peter has done. Peter has laid out the gospel message. He has talked about the Christ that would come. 
He was, it was proved he came because, you know, all these miracles and wonders and signs that, that showed that he was from God. He talks about his death, how they put him to death. He talks about the resurrection, how he did not, uh, would, did not see corruption in Hades. He talks about how this Jesus whom they crucified and now is raised up is sitting at the right hand of the, God, uh, right hand of the throne of God. And he talks about how this Jesus is both Lord and Christ. Now, why do I put so much emphasis on that? We, we talk about these steps of salvation from time to time, you know, and I, I try to include that at the end of my sermons just so that if there is anyone who is hearing, they will, they will understand kind of basically the steps that they need to go through in order to be saved. And I can do that at the end of each sermon because it is so simple. It is easy to understand. Did you hear? see what happened here? They heard the gospel message. Isn't that the first step we talk about? Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. What happened next? In verse 37, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Now they have asked a question and it's a very valid question and that's a question that really a lot of people ought to be asking. Whenever someone learns that they are living in sin, when they are lost in that sin, they ought to be asking men and brethren, what shall we do? What does that indicate to us? What does it indicate to us here? Well, first of all, it indicates, yes, they heard. They heard what Peter said. But it also indicates that they believe what Peter said. Do you see that? They believed what Peter said. Asking, what do we, okay, yes, we hear you. We've killed him. Now, what do we do about that? It's not like we can bring him back or anything. What do we do about that? Also, not only do they believe, but they believe and understand that Jesus is Lord and Christ. Now you might compare that to the confession that talked about in Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. They have heard the message. They have believed the message. They have confessed, they understand Jesus Christ is Lord, not in so many words, but by implication when they ask the question, that's what they're saying. How does Peter respond? Peter says to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. So if you hear and you believe and you understand Jesus is Lord, what do you need to do? You need to repent. That is, change your mind about sin, and you need to be baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for of the remission of your sins. Now that's the gospel. That's what men ought to be obeying in order to become a Christian, in order to begin their life with Christ. And I emphasize begin because that's what it is. It's a beginning. Is there more to do after that? Absolutely. And we read further on down through the chapter and we see that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking in bread and prayers. They had 3,000 in one day had obeyed the gospel. Now, if, if they can obey the gospel in one day after one sermon, does that not tell us the gospel is simple? Now, I'll give you this. He's talking to Jews who have a very uh, very good understanding of what God has revealed to them up to that point. And so, you know, all those prophecies and all of those things, they are embedded in their minds and they very well understand that. So they have a basis to go on. 
But Peter, after one sermon preached one day, they understood and they became Christians. They all obeyed in one day. There is no reason for us to make the gospel any more complicated than what God has made it. So why does it have to be complicated? I have been told that you Church of Christ people are condemning people to hell because you insist that baptism is necessary for salvation. I've been told that. What is our response to that? My response is no. I have done no such thing. Would never do any such thing. The gospel, however, is a different story. The word of God says what it says. And we need to adhere to that. Simply stated, if you obey God, you will be saved. If you don't obey God, you will be lost, condemned to hell. That's what the Bible says. That's what the gospel is. The good news of the gospel, that's what gospel means. The good news is that we don't have to go to hell. That's the good news. Because Jesus Christ died for us on the cross. And he gives us that opportunity. And let me tell you, it is a simple thing to obey the gospel. I know it's a simple thing because I've seen it done so many times. It is not difficult. And yet man wants to complicate. Let's talk about the gospel being singular. Turn with me to Galatians 1. The gospel is simple, but the gospel is singular. In Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, Paul wrote there, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him, talking about Christ, who called you in the grace of Christ to, or probably God there, called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. But there are some who would trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. There is only one gospel. There's only one gospel. I don't know how you can emphasize that any more than what Paul emphasized it right here in Galatians 6, or Galatians 1, 6 through 9. There is only one gospel. And if anyone preaches anything different than what is contained in this one gospel, it no longer becomes the gospel. It's not the gospel because there is not another gospel. There is only one way to the pearly gate, to the crown of life and the friends who wait. Should have had you lead that. Do you even know that song? Maybe not. It doesn't matter. There's only one way. And God intended for it. Can you imagine... Can you imagine how much worse off we would be if God said, you can do it however you want to do it. Make up something. Just make up something and we'll we'll see what we can do. We'll work it out. Nobody would know. Nobody would know. Am I really saved? Is God really going to save me? But you see, we don't have to worry about that because there's only one gospel. And we can read that gospel and we can know that gospel and we can know what God's will is for us 
One of the gripes from the students as we were going through school was how each instructor wants papers turned in, you know, a certain way. They have their form that they want. They have their, you know, what they want in the paper and how many sources and what format you use and all. Every teacher's different. Every teacher's different. And I remember one of them saying one day, if they'd all get together on this, this would be a whole lot easier to get through. We've only got one gospel we have to know, people. There's only one we have to know. So when we think about the simplicity of the gospel, you, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to get this. There's a lot of people that are not rocket scientists who are Christians. And you only have to study one gospel. You only have to preach one gospel. And you say, I'm not preaching. And I, and I say, yes, you are. You're preaching by the way you live your life. You're preaching when you talk to people about the gospel. Do you talk to people about the gospel? Why don't you talk to people about the gospel? Do you think you don't know enough about the gospel? Why? It's simple. There's only one of them. Spend your time in this one gospel, you won't have any trouble with it. We are only asked to preach this one gospel. We don't have to, have to venture out into different areas and all of that. Yes, I talk about a lot of different things whenever I preach, but you don't have to talk a lot about a lot of different things. Paul didn't talk about a lot of different things. Paul talked about what? Christ and Him crucified. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. That's what he preached. That's all we need to be knowing. The gospel is simple. The gospel is singular. And the gospel is saving. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. A lot of times when we go to talk about the gospel and what the gospel is, we tend to go to this passage and we go down and we read verses 3 to 4 where it talks about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's there. And y'all go ahead and read that if you want to. I'm not going to go there. In 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 and 2, Paul said, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. What do we notice from that passage? First of all, the gospel was preached. Okay? It didn't say he's working through preaching it. Do you understand my meaning? He preached it completely. He told what all was involved in the gospel for the Corinthians. He gave them everything. So it was preached. Secondly, we see there that they received it. And so all of the gospel was preached and all of the gospel was received. Thirdly, we see that they stand in that. That is an indication of obedience. Not just a one-time obedience, but standing means you're continuing to stand in that. And so they were continuing to obey in the gospel. And because of that, because it was preached, because they received it, and because they were obedient in those things, then it saved. Do you see that? The gospel is simple. The gospel is singular. And the gospel is saving. Because those who hear it and those who receive, those who receive it and obe are obedient in those things, those are the people who will be saved. Now think about that, that verse there where it talks about which also you received. You remember the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8? And how Philip caught up to the Ethiopian eunuch, you know, he's in his chariot and 
and they go riding along and they're talking about the Isaiah, you know, and it, and it says there that Philip preached Jesus to him. What's interesting to me to that, and, and I know you know where I'm going with this, but the idea there is he preached, past tense, Jesus to him. What happened as a result of that? Because Philip preached Jesus, preached the gospel, the eunuch said, look, here's water. What hinders me to be baptized? Philip preached to him the whole gospel while riding in a chariot. Now, I don't know about you, but I have done some riding in some vehicles. I can remember in my younger days, and to get it closer to a chariot ride, riding in the back of a pickup truck on a dirt road. Okay? Can, y- y'all, some, some of y'all remember that? Can you imagine reading anything while you're doing that? I guess it could be done, but it's not going to be as easy as if you're sitting around a coffee table. And yet, Philip preached the gospel to the eunuch. And he said, here's water, what hinders me to be baptized. And of course, we know the rest of that. He obeyed the gospel, was baptized into Christ, and he went away rejoicing. Because of that. The gospel saves. So what do we do with that? What do we do with that? We were studying church history in school. And there, uh, there's a story about, and I don't remember names. I don't remember specifics. I just remember vaguely this happening in my mind because, you know, school, that's the way it is. But this this young woman was in the process, you heard that word process, right? She was in the process of becoming a Christian and was executed because of her beliefs. Now, did, did that sentence make sense in your mind like it didn't make sense in my mind? Evidently, at some point in time in early church history, they got in their heads that you had to know a whole lot about God's Word before you became a Christian. And so they actually had schools set up that those who wanted to be a Christian could go through that school and after a certain amount of of allotted time learning some things about the gospel, then they could be baptized. This young woman, fully believing that Jesus was a Christ, fully understanding that she needed to obey the gospel, was executed for those beliefs before she ever obeyed the gospel. I don't know, I don't know what to do with that. I don't know what to do with that. Because the Bible is simple. The gospel is simple. And it's, it's one gospel. It's the only one we got. Why do men have to complicate it. We need to be careful that we don't complicate the gospel. We've talked about some different ways of evangelizing in the past. We've talked about, you know, the Back to the Bible series. And, and, I, and there are reasons to use that and there are reasons not to use that. Here's what I would tell you. It depends on the person you're talking to. It's a case-by-case basis. You have to determine where they are at so that you can bring them to where they need to be. On the day of Pentecost, whenever Peter preached that first gospel sermon, those people had a very spiritual background 
of teaching that, that he had to go on. And it didn't take much of him explaining. Now, if, if you go back over there, and I'm just going to go read this real quick, but if you'll notice in verse 40, after he said the, the promise is to you and to your children, all those who are far off, as me as the Lord will, God will call, it says in verse 40, and with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Now, it's still all within that same day, but the sermon that we have recorded here is not all that was said. So understand that. Yes, it is simple. Yes, it is simple. But we do have to make sure that people understand some things. We do have to make sure that they, they understand, you know, what the process is for, why God does this. You know, but those are simple things. And we can show that from Scripture. I have, um, it's been a while, but we did a, we did a lesson on, uh, and I don't even remember what it was called, the, but with, with the circle, you remember the circle, you know, and those are in Christ or in the circle and those, you know, that, that sort of, and that's part of back to the Bible, some, some similar things there. But the idea with, with that lesson was that's a one-time lesson. You sit down with someone for an hour, two hours, something like that. If they have a biblical background, if they understand, you already have a belief in God and things like that, if you, if you can take them from that with that lesson and show them why and how to be a Christian in one lesson. It's not complicated. It's not complicated. And we need to not make it any more complicated than what it is. To you and me, here's what we need to get out of this. There is no excuse for us to not be talking to people about Jesus and the gospel. None. There's no reason to not know the gospel because it is a simple gospel. It's a simple plan. And you need to know it based upon scripture. You, need, you do need to know where those scriptures are. Take them to the Bible. Don't just say, hey, this is what you got to do. Let's go to the Bible and let's look at it. There's no reason to be confused about the gospel because there's only one. There's only one gospel. And God's not the author of confusion. And so if there's confusion, it's not from God. It's from man. There's no reason for anyone to be lost due to the gospel. Because the gospel in its simplicity and its singularity, it saves. And we need to be taking that gospel to the lost. This evening, if you have not obeyed the gospel, why not? As we read through that sermon there on the day of Pentecost, we talked about the different things that must be done. And we saw that demonstrated there in that, in that situation. You've got to hear the gospel. I mean, that's the reason why Christ came, was to bring the word, to bring the message. And then he went back and he sent the Holy Spirit to further inform the apostles of that message so that we could have that message, so we could hear it, whether we're reading it or whether we're hearing it from somebody preaching. We've got to hear the word. And then based upon what you hear, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Do you believe that he died on the cross and was buried in the grave and he rose again on the third day? Do you believe that he now sits at the right hand of the throne of God and that, as Peter said, he is both Lord and Christ? Do you believe that? If so, will you repent of your sins? That's what Peter said you've got to do. Repent. Change your mind. Jesus talked about it. Luke chapter 13, verse 3, verse 5. Peter's talked about it. Paul has talked about it. It's been talked about all through scriptures. You've got to repent. You've got to change your mind about sin. You've got to confess that Jesus is Lord. Confess with the mouth. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Confess with the mouth. 
the Lord Jesus Christ. And then you must submit to that watery grave of baptism, obeying the form of doctrine, Romans chapter 6 and verse 17. That form of doctrine is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is baptism where we come in contact with his death. Romans chapter 6, same chapter, verses 3 through 4, I believe it is. That's the gospel. If you want to be saved from your sins, if you want to be a Christian today, obey that gospel, the simple gospel. Now, understand, that's how you start the process. Not the process of being saved, but the process of being a Christian. Because we grow. We learn more and more as we study and we, and we get into God's Word. We learn lots of different things about God and we'll never study to the depth of, of the knowledge that God has given to us. But we can do that as a Christian and know that we have salvation because the gospel is simple, the gospel is singular, and the gospel is saving. This evening, if you are not a member of the Lord's church, or if you are a member of the Lord's church, you've done those things, but maybe there's something wrong in your life. You remember over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 2, he says, if, you know, that, that big two-letter word, if. You've got to continue in that. You've got to hold fast to that. Continue to walk in the light as he is in the light. 1 John 1 verse 7. If there's something there that is wrong in your life that needs to be corrected, if we can help you correct that, let us help you with that. If you just need prayers of encouragement, whatever it might be, please come tonight, whatever your need might be, as we stand and as we sing. Yeah.